Hello and welcome to this video lesson. This video lesson will be covering concepts of moment of inertia. We're going to start off with some definition and the first definition that we'll cover is inertial mass or translational inertia. And the definition of this is the ability of an object to resist linear acceleration. So for example, if you have two objects, one is a one kilogram mass and the other one is a five kilogram mass, it will be much harder to accelerate the object, which is five kilograms. So that five kilogram mass therefore has a higher inertial mass. Let's look at the definition of the topic of what we're looking at today and that's moment of inertia and another term for it is the rotational inertia and it refers to the ability of an object to resist rotational acceleration. When we were looking at translational inertia that translational inertia or inertial mass is only dependent on the mass of the object. So the heavier that object is, the more difficult it is to accelerate it. However, when we're talking about rotational uh, motion or the moment of inertia, we're, we also have to consider how far that mass is from the axis of rotation. So let's look at a few examples. In the first case here, we're going to have a ruler or any object with a negligible mass. And it's going to be rotating around these two points. And we're going to attach a mass or a point mass of one kilogram on the first one and two kilograms on the second one. And I want you folks to pause your video for a second and think about which one will be tougher to rotate. So if they were stationary originally, which one will be tougher to rotate? So when you think about this, and you can do this as an experiment, you can just attach different masses to end of a ruler at a same distance apart and see which one is tougher to move and you will see that the higher the mass the higher the harder it is to rotate the object so uh, that means the ability of the object to resist rotational acceleration is higher and that moment of inertia is kind of proportional to the amount of mass that you uh, put on it. For the second example, we're going to do something very similar. We're going to have two different rulers, or two same rulers, uh, but we're going to place the same mass this time, but we're going to put it at a different distance away from the axis of rotation. So here we have a one kilogram mass and we are going to put one of them at a distance 2r away from the axis of rotation and one of them at distance r away from axis of rotation and the axis of rotations are highlighted in red and i want you folks to pause your video for a second and think about which one will be harder to rotate So if you actually try this experiment at home, just use a point mass, let's just say one kilogram or 500 grams, use a ruler, go for a distance, let's say uh, 10 centimeters away, uh, and then try rotating that, and then put it 20 centimeters away, try rotating that, and then 30 centimeters, and you will see that it becomes much harder to rotate the object. So the ability of the object to resist that rotational acceleration increases and it increases by a factor which is the square of the distance 
So for example, if originally it was 10 centimeters and then you change it to 30 centimeters, then if that changes the factor for the distance by three, meaning the moment of inertia actually increases by a factor of nine. Okay, let's try this example. It tells us to rate the object in terms of the lowest to highest moment of inertia, assuming that the density is constant and the axis of rotation is shown with the black dots. Okay, so for this example, we have to look at, first of all, how dense everything is. So that's, we can look at that based on the area and the volume. And we also have to look at how far those masses are from the axis of rotation. Looking at the first one, we have a lot of mass, which is distributed right on top there. And it's pretty far away from the axis of rotation. Second one, a good amount of mass about the axis of rotation. And it's less massive than the first case. For the third case, we got uh, a little bit more mass compared to the second case, which is distributed further away from axis of rotation. And because of that, uh, the lowest moment of inertia will then be the second case over here because most of the mass is around the axis of rotation. Second one will be the less massive object and the third one will be the most massive object and the one that has most of its mass furthest away from axis of rotation. For the second part of the example, we have the same objects. So all those three objects are exactly the same, but the axis of rotation is different. So to get an idea about the moment of inertia of the objects, I'm going to divide them into small pieces. And all those pieces are about the same dimensions. And I'm going to treat each piece as a point mass. So you can see that on the long side of the T, I have about six point masses. And on the shorter side, I have about five. One thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is that the lowest moment of inertia usually happens around the center of mass of the object. And to find the center of mass of the object, what we usually do is we look at it either from horizontally or vertically and we look at the mass distribution and we figure out where is the center of those mass distributions. So for example, for this one, we can see that there are six on the left side, five on the right side. So if we look horizontally, for the, we can see that if we count five to the left and five to the right, and that location that I have chosen right there, will be the center of mass because there's five point masses to the right and five point masses to the left. Okay, so now looking at the three cases, we know where the center of mass is. Because the center of mass will be the same for all of the objects. Uh, for the very first one, you can see that the axis of rotation is actually all the way to the left and there's a huge amount of mass which is distributed far away from that axis of rotation. So that first object then will should have a pretty high moment of inertia in terms of magnitude. For the second case, uh, the axis of rotation is actually where the center of mass is or approximately in that area so there's equal amount of mass distributed to the right and to the left and you can see that most of the mass is actually distributed about the axis of rotation meaning that this will have a very low magnitude in terms of moment of inertia 
For the very last case, you can see that the center of mass is still at the same location. However, the axis of rotation is all the way to the right. Comparing the second and third case, we can actually see that for the second case, most of the mass is distributed where the axis of rotation is. For the third one, there are a little bit more mass uh, which are distributed further away from the axis of rotation, mostly comparing it to the second case. And therefore, the third case will have a higher moment of inertia as compared to the second case. And comparing the third case to the first case, we can see that for the first case, most of the mass is actually distributed really far away from the axis of rotation, meaning the moment of inertia of that one will be very high, and therefore the lowest moment of inertia is the second case. The next one will be the third case, and the highest moment of inertia will be the very first uh, case. The next question uh, tells us to show the location of the axis of rotation that would yield the lowest moment of inertia for the following shapes. And we are assuming that they all have the same thickness. So the first three are kind of shown as a 2D shape. So we're going to assume that they have the same thickness and the second sets are more 3D so you can kind of get an idea of how they look like. Okay, to estimate the location, we're going to divide the parts into equal sections and this time I didn't actually divide them into pieces but I'm just showing them as point masses. And then once you do that, what you're going to do is you're going to count the number of point masses. In this case, I have about eight, and then I will find the center. So I want a location when there's four point masses to the right and four to the left, and that location over there would be the spot where the center of masses and therefore the axis of rotation when it's placed there will yield to the lowest moment of inertia and that's when the object is rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise. For the second case we'll do the same thing we are actually putting point masses and then we're going to count them in the x-axis or in the horizontal direction and we can see that there is about about 11 in total uh, point masses so in the x direction uh, if we want to find the center of that that's uh, that means there should be five to the left five to the right and that point over there would be the center of mass and also the axis of rotation which will yield the lowest moment of inertia when the object is rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now for the third case over here we're going to do the same thing we are going to uh, put point masses all along the objects and then we have to count all those. So I have about nine to the left side and I have 20 on the right side. So I have 29 in total and when I'm looking at the X direction if I count all the dots It's 29 and if I divide that by 2 I get 14 and a half so then I have to count either from the left side or from the right side and when I get to about 14 and a half to 15 that's when I have to stop so that's the first second and the third one gives me 15 so the axis of rotation 
should be somewhere uh, on that area so now since this is actually a 2d shape to find that center of rotation you actually can count all the dots that you have in the vertical axis as well and you do the same thing and to actually get 14 and a half you actually have to go up uh, to the third row again so meaning that the axis of rotation in the x direction and the y direction when you count them up will be approximately at that location over there uh, for our 3d shapes the first one is just a sphere or a ball and you can see that if you put this axis of rotation right at the center so at an axis of rotation that passes through the very center of the sphere doesn't matter from which direction it will always yield to the lowest moment of inertia and the reason for that is because at that point the mass distribution to the right and to the left of the object will be the exact same uh, for the second case that we have over there uh, what I'm doing is I'm adding some point masses to get an idea about where that center of mass is. I'm looking at when this object is actually rotating clockwise and anti-clockwise. So I have about uh, 5, 4, 9, 12, 14, 17 dots. So the center of that would be 8.6 so then I have to count the numbers vertically and eight and a half comes in the second row there and if I look at things horizontally and if I count them uh, eight and a half would be at the center so the axis of rotation where it would yield the lowest moment of inertia when the object is rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise will be right at the center uh, right there and again this is when the object is rotating in the uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise but if you want to figure out the best axis of rotation for the objects rotating in other axes we do have to look at look at it from different views so in this case uh, when we want to look at the object rotating uh, into the page or out of the page we actually have to look at the top view and when we do that, when, when we count all the point masses, we can see that it, that axis of rotation actually happens right at the center of the object. And therefore, if you want to rotate it that way, the axis of rotation is also shown there. The very last case that we'll look at for this example is a mechanical pencil. And for this example, we're actually assuming that the object has uniform density. So we are going to uh, put point masses all along the object. And the object really looks like a, a rod. And we are going to count the dots and find the center point. And that would be the center of mass and also the axis of rotation where the object well, has lowest moment of inertia so it can be rotated very easily at that point or easier at that point compared to other points uh, when we're rotating it clockwise or anti-clockwise. One thing that I really want to point out in this case is that we are assuming that the density is uniform along this pencil and let's say we had a pencil where the location where you're gripping the pencil was actually made out of metal and the rest of it was made out of plastic and let's say the metallic part was actually made out of steel so much higher density than plastic in a case like that you would actually put more point masses in the area where the density is higher 
And when you do that, and when you count the dots again, and you find the center point, it gives you a much better idea about where the center of mass is. Okay, let's look at one way that we can explain how we come up with the equation of moments of inertia. Here we have a disk with radius r, and I use capital R to show the whole radius of the disk. It's rotating with angular velocity of omega. It has many point masses, uh, and those are some examples of the point masses, and it contains infinite number of point masses, let's say. And here I have separated one of those point masses. I'm going to call that mi. It's the distance ri away from the center. And since it's going with, since the object is rotating with angular velocity of omega, that means that uh, that point mass also has a velocity uh, or velocity i. All right, so now I know that velocity of that point mass is equal to omega times the, how far that point mass is from the center. And I know that the kinetic energy of that point mass is equal to half times its mass times its velocity squared. So now if I replace V with omega r, I get one half m i omega squared r i squared. Now I can write the total kinetic energy of the object as the summation of all the kinetic energy of the point masses all around the disk. And when I do that, uh, I know that some of the values after the summation marks are actually constant, so I'm going to pull them out. I know that the omega is constant for all of the point masses. I know the half is constant, so I'm left with half omega squared and the summation of all the masses multiplied by their radius squared. And when I compare this with the equation of motion or the kinetic energy for a point mass, uh, the halves are the same. The omega squared is same as the velocity squared. And the m value is usually the translational inertia. Uh, and in our new equation, that corresponds to the moment of inertia. And we are going to indicate that with letter I. And different textbooks always use different letters, but for the sake of this video, we will use letter I for moment of inertia. So we can finally write the kinetic energy of a system when it's rotating around a certain axis as half i omega squared, where i is equal to the summation of all the masses multiplied by their distance away from the axis of rotation. So r is always represents the distance away from the axis of rotation. All right, let's look at an example here. So it says to find the moment of inertia for the following objects. And we got three different situations. On the first one, we have an object which is ro rotating about its axis of rotation which is all the way to the left and there is a point mass of one kilogram attached to it two meters away 
from the axis of rotation. The second and the third case have the same point masses, but the way they're arranged uh, is very different. So the axis of rotation is different and the location where the masses are, are also different. So let's explore how, how changing those positions actually changes the moment of inertia. For the very first case, the moment of inertia is equal to the summation of all the masses multiplied by their distance from the axis of rotation squared. In this case, we only have one mass, so all we have to do is multiply its mass by its distance away from the axis of rotation, which is 2 squared, and we get the our moment of inertia to be 2 kilogram meters squared for the very first one. For the second case we have the same equation uh, but in this case we actually have two masses so we have to add them up so for the first mass the mass is 1 kilogram and it's actually 2 meters away from the axis of rotation, so 1 times 2 squared, plus the second mass is 2 kilograms and is 2 meters away from axis of rotation, so 2 times 2 squared. And when we do the math, we get 4 plus 2 times 4, which is 8, which gives us a total of 12 kilogram meters squared as the moment of inertia for that second case. For the very last case, we are going to use the same equation uh, as we always have been. So in this case, the first mass is one kilogram and it's two meters away from the axis of rotation. So we have to do one times two squared and we have to add the second mass. The second mass is two kilograms, but this time it's actually a distance four meters away from the axis of rotation because we have uh, two plus two being four in, and that's the distance. So two times four squared would be the moment of inertia of the second mass. So adding them up, we get four plus 32, which equals to 36 kilograms meters squared. So now it's very important to actually look at these two cases and see that um, just a very small change, changing the axis of rotation and bringing it to the left side and moving one of those uh, masses and bringing it to the right side has changed the moment of inertia by three times. So what, ended, what actually happens in this case is when the axis of rotation comes to the left side uh, the distance away from the two kilogram mass actually increases by a large amount uh, which is actually twice as more so then the moment of inertia of that second mass increases and therefore the total uh, moment of inertia of that case increases by a large amount So far we've been looking at moments of inertia of point masses rotating around a certain axis of rotation. Uh, that's not always the case. So in most of our real life situations, we actually have objects rotating along certain axes of rotations. We call, we usually call these a continuous systems because they are a continuous set of masses or point masses and uh, when the moment of inertia is equal to the summation of mass times r squared uh, when it comes to a continuous system we can actually use an integral and do integral of r squared multiplied by dm, which is a tiny mass or a point mass in the object. 
Okay, let's do this example here. We got a ring uh, which has a radius of r and there's a continuous mass going around it. So using our equation that says moment of inertia is equal to integral of r squared dm, we know that the radius in which the mass is distributed is constant. That radius actually doesn't change. So I can bring that out of the integral sign so it becomes r squared multiplied by the integral of dm and in this case the uh, when you take the integral of dm it just becomes m so you're left with mr squared uh, where m is the mass of the ring and r is the distance away uh, the distance uh, from the axis of rotation. In this case, uh, that axis of rotation actually has to be right at the center. And if we look at it uh, in terms of the first equation, we can also see the same thing because the mass is distributed along radius r. And if you total all their masses, you just get the total mass of the system and that distance is always the same for all the masses so even looking at it in terms of the first equation you would still get that moment of inertia is equal to um, m multiplied by r squared here is a list of some common objects that are often used in physics and engineering. The first one is a ring and its moment of inertia is mr squared and that's the example that we just did previously. If we have a cylinder that's rotating at its center of mass or uh, an axis which goes through its center then its moment of inertia is equal to 1 over 2 mr squared and that's the same if you have a disc with a negligible thickness. If you have a sphere and if the axis of rotation goes through the center of the sphere then the moment of inertia is 2 over 5 mr squared and if you have a rod and if you have a rod with the length l and certain cross section it doesn't matter what the cross section is whether it's a square whether it's a rectangle uh, if it is or even a circle if it is rotating about its center or the center of mass its moment of inertia is 1 over 12 ml squared however if it is rotating at its edge or about its edge then the moment of inertia actually increases by four times and it goes from 1 over 12 ml squared to 1 over 3 ml squared. So as you can see once again when you change the axis of rotation you can significantly change the moment of inertia. As mass, as more mass is distributed further away from axis of rotation that moment of inertia is going to increase. Let's look at this example. So it says the following object is rotating about its center at 4 radians per second. If the object is 10 kilogram, find its kinetic energy. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write all the information that we have. So we know that mass is 10 kilograms. The angular velocity is 4 radians per second. We know that, it, well, we don't know what the kinetic energy is and that's what we're trying to find. So the kinetic energy is half, um, half multiplied by the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity squared. So we have to do 1 over 2 and multiply it by the moment of inertia. In this case, it says the rod is rotating about its center. And that's a key word there. That means that we have to use 1 over 12 ml squared. And we have all the information. So then all we have to do is really plug all the informations in. And 
once we put everything together, we get that the total kinetic energy of the rod rotating about its center is actually 166.6 or if we take all the significant figures into consideration about 200 joules. Uh, so the second part asks us what would be the kinetic energy if the axis of rotation was at its end instead of the center. So we have to use the same kinetic energy equation, still half i omega squared. However, the moment of inertia now changes. And since it's rotating about its end, it becomes 1 over 3 ml squared. Once we put everything together, all, all the numbers in, we get approximately 700 joules. And you can see that there, the energy has increased by four times when we have increased or, or when we have changed the axis of symmetry from one point to another. Okay, let's talk about some of the derivations of the formulas or how do we actually get the moment of inertia of a cylinder being 1 over 2 mr squared. So what we have to do first is take a tiny section of the cylinder. Here I have zoomed in to show you that um, section and you can see that one of the length is dr because it's a really small part of the radius. The next part doesn't really have a name. I'm going to call it dx for now. And the other edge right there has to do with the length. The overall length is capital L. So we're going to call the uh, small length dl or a tiny portion of the length there. Okay, we're going to write down the range of the values that the length, the radius, and that x value can take. The length, the smallest value for the length is 0, and the largest value is the total length of the cylinder, being capital L with our notations. For the radius, uh, it can be 0, that's the smallest value that it can be. And the largest value can be is capital R, or the radius of the whole cylinder. Now for the dx uh, edge there, the smallest value that it can be is just 0. And the largest value that it can be is the whole circumference. The circumference being dependent on the lowercase r. And it is very important to distinguish the fact that this is really dependent on the lowercase r or the area that we're considering and not the capital R. And knowing this difference will help us later when we're actually taking the integral because if we consider it as capital R here, it becomes a constant value, and when we're integrating it, we actually take that constant out of the integration, and that would give us an incorrect answer. So know that the x value is dependent on the lowercase r or the radius, and that we need to make sure that we take that into consideration when we are taking the integral. Okay, now I know that the density of my, the density equation is mass over volume, meaning mass can be expressed as density times volume. So if I want to figure out the mass of my small object there, or small particle there, dm is equal to rho, which is the density, multiplied by 
uh, the volume. So I use dm as the mass of my small particle, rho as the density, and dv as the volume of my uh, particle. And I use dv and not d rho because the density is constant throughout the whole uh, object. I know that my moment of inertia is equal to the integral of r squared dm and I know that dm is rho dv as I said above and I know that the volume is equal to the multiplication of all those edges so dx multiplied by dr multiplied by dl So now I can say that I is equal to R squared rho dx dr and dl. So I just change dm to rho dx dr dl. I know that my rho is a constant, so I can take that out of my integral. And since I have three different variables, I can just take a triple, uh, I can just take an uh, integral of each one with respect to where they start or so their smallest range to their l largest range. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, again, we did say that we need to note that x is dependent on that radius r. So I'm going to take that integral first and use the results. Uh, to integrate further. So now i is equal to rho multiplied by integral of dx starting from 0 and going to a maximum value 2 pi r multiplied by integral of r squared dr and dl and then it becomes rho 2 pi r, so that's just x going from 2 pi r to 0, which just gives 2 pi r, and then multiply by integral of r squared dr, and multiply by integral of TL, dl. So now the radius, um, these two have to be multiplied by each other. And again, if I, if I had chosen uh, the maximum value of x to be r capital r and then they wouldn't multiply and that would give me an incorrect result so now i is equal to rho 2 pi times r cubed dr dl the r is integrated from 0 to capital r which is the radius of the whole cylinder and l goes from 0 to the total length they're not dependent, so I don't have to worry about integrating one first before the other. And finally, I have i is equal to rho times 2 pi r to the 4 over 4, going from 0 to r, and l from 0 to l. So expanding everything, I get 2 pi rho r to the 4. Uh, this time r is the capital R, multiply capital L. So now my moment of inertia, uh, canceling out the 2 on top, I get pi over 2 rho r to the 4 multiplied by L. And finally what I have to do is I have to express that rho value in terms of the density of the whole object which is the cylinder. So let's do that right here. So I know that the density is equal to m over v and for a cylinder that's the mass of the cylinder 
over its volume and its volume is pi r squared multiplied by its length r and note that i'm showing r with capital r and l as capital l that's r is the total radius of the cylinder and l is the total length of the cylinder so now plugging those in for the density i get that the moment of inertia is equal to pi over 2 multiplied by m divided by pi r squared l and multiplied by r to the 4 multiplied by l now i can cancel a few things out the pi's cancels out the l's cancel out and the r squared in the denominator goes away and i'm only left with r squared on top which gives me a final equation of one half m r squared for the moment of inertia of a cylinder all right now we're going to do this example once again but this time we're going to do it in a much more efficient manner and the reason i'm doing this in two different ways is to show you that uh, for any engineering problem or any physics problem uh, there are many there's usually many different ways of coming up with the solution and it is very important that you try to do it in a most efficient way as possible okay so now i am going to take a little cross section so you can kind of see what i'm doing here and then I'm going to take, instead of taking one tiny particle, I'm going to take one whole uh, ring with a certain thickness out. And I know, the ra uh, I know that the radius of the whole cylinder is R, or capital R, and the length of the whole cylinder is L. And I'm going to zoom in in the section that I have here. And I'm going to label some of the sections. So here, the radius that I'm looking at from the center to the ring that I have chosen is R. And I'm going to indicate that with a lowercase r. The thickness is dr, so a very small thickness. I'm just in some color so you can see that I'm actually taking a thickness out and I know that the other parameter that I need to sh uh, show is the total length of it and in this case the total length is actually going to equal to the length of the whole cylinder so I know that dv is equal to L, which is the total length of my uh, section that I'm taking, multiplied by dr, which is the thickness of the section that I'm looking at, multiplied by that uh, circumference there. And that circumference is equal to 2 pi r, r being a lowercase r, and this is actually very similar to the what we came up with when we did the integrals of the individual parts last time but now we're just taking everything together and that's making our life a lot easier so now moment of inertia is equal to integral of r squared dm and that is equal to r squared rho 2 pi r dr times l going to take everything that's constant out of the uh, integral so 2 pi rho and the length is constant and I'm only left with integral of r cubed dr and I'm going to take the integral of that from 0 to r because that is the range that that r value can take smallest one being zero largest one being capital r or the radius of the whole cylinder and one, once i take the integral 
I get, and once I cancel a few things out, I get pi over 2 rho L times R to the 4. Once again, I know that the density is m over v or m over pi r squared l. And once I plug that in, once I put that density uh, inside my equation from above, the pi's cancel, the l's cancel, and the radius squared in the denominator denominator also cancel out cancels out and i'm left with one half m r squared and again we get the same answer but it was much easier uh, to uh, do this in terms of number of steps that we had to go through so as you're doing uh, questions or as you're doing any physics questions make sure that you um, not only focus on getting the correct answer, but also getting it as efficiently as possible. For the very last example, we're going to find the moment of inertia of a rod in two situations. One situation where the axis of rotation is right at the center, and the second one where it's at the very end. So for in this case, the rod is a, has a cross section which is a rectangle. It has a length x and a width of y. And what I'm going to do is take a cross section uh, of the particle that I'm going to take and integrate. I'm going to zoom on it right here. And you can see that uh, it's got a little thickness. That thickness is in terms of L. So I'm going to call that thickness DL. And I'm going to label the width and height, the same width, as high, width and a length as the uh, cross section of the actual rod. So now the volume of this little particle here is xy times dl. And the density of the whole shape is equal to m over v, or mass divided by length times width times uh, depth. So a moment of inertia is equal to integral of r squared times dm. In this case, r refers to distance away from the axis of rotation. And in this particular example, we're using letter L for instead of r. So that's not a big deal. All we have to do is, in our equation, change that r to a length letter instead. So. That's what I have done right here. So i is equal to the integral of l squared dm. And now instead of dm, I'm going to replace that with rho dv. And I know that my dv is x times y times dl. So on the next line, I have integral of L squared, but instead of rho, right away I'm going to replace that by m over Lxy. And I do that just to make things a little bit simpler later on. And note that that L value is actually a capital L referring to the total length, and it's actually a constant value, and it's not something that we're going to integrate in this case. Once I do this, once I put that row in right away, I can actually cancel out the x and y, and my equation becomes a little bit easier to deal with. So now what we'll do is we'll take all the constants away uh, from the integral sign. So we get m over l on the left side, and then integral l squared dl and that's my final equation and 
I will use the same equation for the two different cases. The only difference is where I will uh, take my integral, so or how I will take my integral, what is the range of the integral that I will take. So for the very first case over here, the axis of rotation is right at the center. And I have certain distance away to the right side and a certain distance away to the left side. So again, axis of rotation is here. I have to go about L over 2 because uh, I'm right at the center. So to the right side, I have L over 2. And I have L over 2 to the left side. So positive L over 2 is the value that I will use for the right side. And negative L over 2 is the value I will use for my left side. Once I integrate that, it becomes m over l, and I get l cubed over 3 for the integration. And doing that over those uh, range, I will get m over 3l multiplied by l cubed over 8 minus negative l cubed over 8 and that is equal to m over 3l what goes inside the brackets is l cubed over 4 and if I multiply them together I will end up getting m l cubed over 12l Now the L cancels out in the denominator and I'm left with M over 12 L squared as my moment of inertia for the first case where the object is rotating about the center. For my second case, I will be using the exact same equation I is equal to M over L and getting the integral of that from zero to L l squared dl in this case is 0 to d 0 to l because the axis of rotation is right at the very end so it starts at a zero distance away all the way to l distance away where l is the length of the rod so now i know that i is equal to m over l uh, L cubed over 3, this time integrating it from L to 0. A little bit easier this time becomes M over L, L cubed, sorry, M, yeah, M over 3, L cubed over L. The L's cancel out, and I'm left with ML squared over 3 as my final moment of inertia uh, for the second case. And once again, you can see that uh, just changing the axis of rotation from the center to the very end of the rod will change the moment of inertia of the object by four times.